two months away from an impending October 1958 ban on atmospheric nuclear testing, the U.S. Defense Nuclear Agency rushed to test an audacious new defense capability, man-made radiation belts. Codenamed Operation Argus, the mission was initiated as a deeply classified U.S. Navy-led project to see if the United States could use its nuclear weapons to cast a protective shield around the Earth. Previous tests had shown that a man-made radiation belt could potentially disable or destroy intercontinental ballistic missile warheads. At least three experiments were conducted before the task force was quickly and quietly disbanded. Many records of the test are still missing today. The Christopolis Effect In 1958, Hanson Baldwin discovered a great military secret plan, Operation Argus. The operation sought to detonate nuclear weapons in outer space to interfere with enemy weapons, based on the research of Greek-American nuclear physicist Nicholas Christopoulos. The operation was initially called Hardtack Argus, and then Floral, but both of these names were abandoned for simply Argus. It was funded by the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project, with a total of $9,023,000. The scientific hypothesis and call for testing behind Operation Argus came from an unpublished paper by Christopoulos developed at the Lawrence Radiation Observatory. He sought to confirm the self-titled Christopolis effect, which predicted that detonating high-altitude nukes would make a radiation belt covering the atmosphere. It was thought that the radiation could disable missile warheads by entrapping charged particles along magnetic lines of force and damaging the warhead's electronic components. He had hoped that the results would generate a new defense mechanism in case of a nuclear war, giving the United States the option of forming a shell of electrons around Earth as protection. The previous hardtack teak test had shown encouraging results when it disrupted radio communications, although in that case it had not been the result of a radiation belt, as in the one Christopoulos hoped to generate. Operation Argus was implemented and executed in a quick manner, as a response to the upcoming ban on atmospheric and exoatmospheric testing dictated by the Eisenhower Moratorium. It was also conducted as a direct response to the Sputnik crisis, the public panic that came when the USSR launched the first satellite into space the year before. The plan to detonate atomic weapons in space to create a radiation belt around Earth's magnetic field was carried out in about half a year, a surprisingly small window of time. Due to the rule-breaking nature of the tests, the military had to borrow equipment from the International Geophysical Year to hide what they were doing. Task Force 88 On April 28, 1958, the U.S. Navy created Task Force 88 to carry out Operation Argus. As soon as the operation was over and the reports were written, the task force would be dissolved, and its findings would be kept secret by the Pentagon. Several vessels were involved in the mission. The X-017A missiles were to be launched mainly from the USS Norton Sound. The ship would also serve for training, as most of those conducting the tests were unfamiliar with the missile. Its captain, Arthur A. Gralla, also served as commando for the task force. The Norton Sound also carried a special Air Force Cambridge Research Center radar used to monitor the tests. The USS Tarawa was used as an overall command ship, carrying an MSQ-1A radar aboard for tracking the missile. The VS-32 aircraft on board were used for observation and photography of the operation. Several other ships served as a weather front line making way for the Tawara, also carrying out the safety precautions of a destroyer escort. These were the USS Warrington, Bierce, Hammerberg, and Courtney. The USS Neosho was sent along to the Southern Hemisphere to refuel the vessels and offer logistics services, such as radar and communication equipment. Finally, the USS Albemarle was a surprise addition that the task force had not asked for. The ship was sent to the Atlantic Ocean for an alleged shakedown after being overhauled. It mostly carried impressive recording instruments with which the effect of the tests were recorded at a conjugate point in the Northern Hemisphere, around the Alaskan Azor Archipelago. Operation Argus Extensive preparation for Operation Argus had to happen swiftly and in secret. The East Coast unit of Task Force 88 had to conduct drills using high-altitude anti-aircraft rockets while on their way to the South Atlantic on the USS Warrington. A total of 14 drills were carried out between August 12th and 22nd to test procedures and train the members of the task force within their individual assignments. Among them, as stated in the Operation Argus 1958 report released by the DOD, was the, quote, stationing of ships, MSQ-1A radar tracking by the USS Neosho and the USS Tarawa, communications, positioning of sky camera S-2F aircraft, and area surveillance S-2F aircraft. In order to capture the results of the operation, two satellites were launched into space. The first was Explorer 4, launched in July of 1958, under the guise of belonging to the International Geophysical Year, a multinational effort to explore and study Earth from space together. Physicist James Van Allen, 
who was in charge of the satellite's construction, was fully aware of the satellite's real goal. Explorer 4 successfully went into space aboard an Army Jupiter C missile on July 26th. It only carried enough battery to work for 60 days, leaving little room for unforeseen changes or mistakes. The other satellite meant to capture the results of the blast was Explorer 5, which failed to launch on August 24th. The operation moved ahead without it. Aside from the satellite tracking system, Task Force 88 used technology and resources from multiple other organizations to record the results of the experiment. The Naval Research Laboratory, the Smithsonian, the Army Map Service and Signal Research and Development Laboratory, and the Ballistic Research Laboratory. One of the most crucial elements of the operation was choosing a test site. To fully observe the effect of radiation stuck in Earth's magnetic field, the United States needed an optimal position. It was established that the test had to be conducted between 35 and 55 degrees away from the equator. Furthermore, the missile's altitude limit meant that the tests had to be held in the southern hemisphere so that it could reach the global magnetic field. Due to the off-center position of the magnetic field, it's closer to the surface in the southern hemisphere, only 400 miles above. Three tests. The shots of Operation Argus were top-secret clandestine experiments. Task Force 88 traveled to the South Atlantic, setting on remote waters 1,100 miles away from Cape Town. Three high-altitude tests were conducted using the W25 1.7 kiloton warhead to analyze how the radioactive isotopes and charged particles trapped within the Earth's magnetic field would react. Among the goals were to see whether they would interfere with electronics, communications, and radars. These warheads, developed originally for the air-to-air -air rocket Genie, were very light and relatively small, making it easy to handle and easier to shoot into space. Launching to the highest altitude possible was partially done to reduce the crew's exposure to ionizing radiation. The three missiles used for the tests were modified Lockheed X-17A three-stage missiles and were shot from the USS Norton Sound. The few released records indicate that the Argus explosion succeeded in creating artificial electron belts due to beta decay. Beta decay occurs when a fast, energetic electron is emitted from an atomic nucleus and turns the nuclide into fission fragments. The belts did not disperse soon after the tests, but instead remained for weeks, affecting radio and radar transmissions as hypothesized by Christopoulos. The tests served not only for military defense purposes, but also furthered nuclear physics immensely by proving the Christopoulos effect. The Greatest Scientific Experiment Ever Conducted The promise of the Christopoulos effect had been put to the test. The United States hoped that the results would lead to a new method of deterrence, a plan to put out an enemy attack before it reached its intended target. However, while the tests confirmed the Christopoulos hypothesis, they failed to produce an effect sufficient to reliably damage an incoming nuclear warhead. On the other hand, the tests did prove that nuclear weapons could be used to create an effect that would disable satellites or disrupt radio communications, including blacking out radars. Christopoulos himself responded to the tests, stating, quote, For the first time, an experiment was conducted in outer space on a global scale, where all the measured quantities were related to a known cause, namely to the trapping in the Earth's field of a known number of electrons of a known energy, injected at a known location at a known time. For carrying out the tests successfully, Task Force Commander Captain Arthur R. Grala was given the Legion of Merit. The Department of Defense was working on declassifying parts of Operation Argus when a New York Times reporter, Hanson Baldwin, contacted them to let them know the Times would be publishing an article on the tests. Conversations had been ongoing between the Department of Defense and the New York Times to stall the story for as long as possible, so that the U.S. government could control the narrative. The New York Times was facing pressure too, as other news articles caught whiffs or hints of the secret tests and threatened to break the news, albeit with less complete and accurate information. The source of the leak is unclear. The DOD failed to indefinitely stall the release of the story, but continued to exert as much control as possible over what exactly got released. When the news broke in March of 1959, it was headlined, The Greatest Scientific Experiment Ever Conducted. Although the operation was announced and the article published, the complete results of the test were only declassified in April of 1982. Interestingly, some of the records from Task Force 88 have remained secret, not because the U.S. has kept them classified, but because they have been lost or destroyed since. Notably, footage of the radiation levels during the test has allegedly been lost, a fact that has not gone unnoticed by the Veterans Administration, which recorded a high number of leukemia claims among those involved. Missing and destroyed documentation has made it difficult for an accurate assessment of radiation exposure. <laughs>